Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Ms. Pragya Shukla, Assistant Professor, IMT College of Law. My topic for today's discussion is judicial activism. We'll move on with the meaning of judicial activism. Judicial activism is a sharp edged tool which has to be used as a scalpel by a skillful surgeon to cure the malady, not as a Rampuri knife which can kill. It is a word quoted by Justice J.S. Perma. This line itself says that the judicial activism is acting as a tool, as a sharp edged tool, which is used as a scalpel by a skillful surgeon. It means that this technique, this process must be used by a person who is skilled in it. Black's Law Dictionary states that judicial activism is a philosophy of judicial decision making whereby judges allow their personal views about public policy, among other factors, to guide their decisions. In this context, the former seat Chief Justice of India, A.M. Ahmadi, has rightly said that in recent years, as the incumbents of parliament have become less representative of the people, of the will of the people, there has been a growing sense of public frustration with the democratic process. This is the reason why the Supreme Court had to expand its jurisdiction by, at times, issuing novel directions to the executive something it would never have resorted to had the other two democratic institutions functioned in an effective manner. We'll move on to theories of judicial activism. There are two theories of judicial activism. First, theory of vacuum filling. According to this theory, inactivity, laziness, incompetence, indifference, indiscipline, lack of integrity, corruption, greed, and disrespect of law by the legislature and or the executive creates a power vacuum. Nature never allows vacuum to continue and it becomes necessary for the remaining organ that is judiciary to widen its purview and to fill in the vacuum. This theory works on the concept of gap filling process. Uh, while there is some gap created by any legislature, the judiciary acts as a uh, vacuum filler or gap filler for that so that the easy function easy function of justice can be granted next theory of social want this theory affirms that when the current legislation fails to address the problems of the society and cannot provide the alleviation the judiciary has to undertake the task of societal transformation to administer justice to the agreed thus where legislature falters, the judiciary corrects. This theory works on the social society's need, want for justice, where uh, these all wants and these all problems are not sorted by the legislature, judiciary comes into the picture. The last line itself says that where legislature fails, judiciary corrects them. Next, there are some reasons for this process to come into picture or judicial activism to come in picture. It is an uphill task to identify clear cut reasons for judicial activism. Moreover, universal as ac acceptance of all these reasons may not be guaranteed. But the following reasons are well, well accepted under Indian conditions, which enforce judiciary to become hyperactive during execution of judicial functions. First, judicial enthusiasm. Judicial enthusiasm is the term given to the judicial act activism process, a, a synonym given to the judicial activism, where judiciary is acting out of the uh, out of the purview of the powers given to them, and this is only based on the justice to all. Next, legislative vacuum. When legislature creates certain gap between uh, in the laws or while giving or while uh, enforcing the rights for the citizen, judiciary, uh, there is a need for judiciary to come into the picture. Next, moral pressure on judiciary. Judiciary is acting as, as the custodian of, of fundamental rights or custodian of uh, 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 citizens. So judiciary is having some moral pressure on them so that the justice must be done near collapse of responsible government when government collapses when responsible government denies 
or collapses, then judiciary comes into the picture. The constitutional provisions, there are some provisions mentioned in constitution by purview of which the judicial activism comes into the picture. Guardian of fundamental rights, of course, judiciary is the guardian of and custodian of fundamental rights. Public confidence, public has some faith, belief in judiciary and believes that if justice is not performed by um, giving equal rights by law, there, there is certain guardian or some eye-watching authority uh, above legislature and executive which will surely work in the favor of the citizens. Next, enthusiasm of the individual players. The above reasons are indicative and not exhaustive. There may be also many reasons based on the prevailing situations which alert the judiciary to become catalyst of change. Origin of judicial activism in India. Law is originated from two sources. The primary source is through legislature and the secondary source is the judge made law through judicial interpretation of the existing legislature. Judicial activism emerges out of these judge made laws. The evidence of judicial activism in India can be traced back in 1893. Allahabad High Court Judge S. Mahmood held that the precondition for hearing a case would be accomplished only when someone speaks. In the case, in, uh, in this case, the under trial was not in a position to afford a lawyer. So judiciary came into a picture and asked the under trial to uh, have a lawyer or provide them a pro bono service. Constitutional basis of the judicial review has been provided by Article 30 as it entrusts the Supreme Court and the High Court the power to interpret the pre-constitutional law and to settle whether they match with the values and principles of our present constitution. If there is any conflict, they become deemed ineffective until their adoption through amendments, but they must be constitutionally compatible, otherwise any deviation makes them void. Development of judicial activism. In early 1950s, court legitimized government actions and observed judicial restraints. The only conflict between the court and the parliament at that time was related to right to property. However, constitutional amendments have evaded the embarrassing decisions taken by the Supreme Court. Several laws related to immovable property have been excluded from the scope of judicial review thanks to the amendments made in first uh, made in uh, 1951, 1955, and 1964. Consequently, in order to improve the rights of citizens, when the Supreme Court was humiliated, it began adopting a more extensive interpretation of the Constitution. We'll uh, uh, now see how judicial activism grows through case law. In 1962, in Sakal newspaper, Private Limited versus Union of India, government wanted to regulate the number of pages vis-a-vis -vis price of the newspaper as per Newspaper Act of 1956 and the Daily Newspaper Order of 1960. The Supreme Court expanded the scope of freedom of speech guaranteed by Article 19, Clause 1, Subclause A of the Constitution and held that newspaper could not be regulated like other businesses as it was a carrier of thought and information. Supreme Court became more active in late 60s. In the case of uh, Golaf Nath versus the state of Punjab in 1967, Supreme Court in a thin six against five majority held that the parliament could not take away or abridge the fundamental rights by amending the constitution. In, re in retaliation, the parliament passed 24th amendment. This 24th amendment was challenged in the landmark case of Keshwananda Bharti versus the state of Kerala. The, the apex court with its largest bench of 13 judges held that parliament could amend every constitutional provisions, but the basic structure of the constitution could not be altered. This is the best example of judicial activism till now, which established the supremacy of the non-elected judiciary over the elected parliament. Further, in 1975, in Indira Gandhi versus Raj Narayan case, Supreme Court struck down the 39th constitutional amendment on the ground that it was a complete refusal of right to equality preserved in the Article 14. It was held that free and fair election being the essential feature of democracy could not be violated. 
This decision legitimated the basic structural concept in order to save the democracy. It is counter majoritarian check on democracy. Further, Supreme Court of India, through uh, though graduated into all powerful apex court, but its institutional fragility was evident in the ADM Jabalpur versus Shivakan Shukla in 1976. The judgment exposed the darkest chapter in the history of Supreme Court, whether when the court by a majority of four is to one held that there was no malafides entangled in the presidential promulgation suspending fundamental rights guaranteed by Article 19. The court held the basic principle of law, but could not declare the presidential order issued under Article void on the ground that eliminated one basic feature of the Constitution. Supreme Court in the post-emergency period tried to regain its esteem lost in Jabalpur case. Professor Bakshi's characterization of judicial populism is a, as a part of post-emergency catas catastrophic catharsis was correct. Partly it was an attempt to refurbish the image of the court tarnished by a few emergency decisions and also an attempt to seek new historical basis of legitimation of judicial power. Judicial activism in post-emergency period showed liberal interpretation of Article 14 and Article 21. Further, a major development was noticed in the case of Menaka Gandhi versus Union of India 1978. In this case, Mrs. Gandhi, Mrs. Gandhi's passport was impounded. She challenged the action as it violated her personal liberty. The court held that impounding of the passport was unconstitutional as it did not follow the rules of natural justice, that is, nemo judex in causa sua and or the alterum party, and therefore held void. This verdict of the Apex Court overruled the Gopalan case and ensured the validity of personal liberty under Article 21 and Article 19 of the Constitution. This exhibit a fine example of interpretive stability dimension of judicial activism. Further, in Charles Shobraj versus Superintendent of Central Jail 1978 and in Sunil Batra versus Delhi Administration 1978, the Apex Court held that the prisoners could not be striped of their fundamental rights. Further, in Minerva Mills Limited versus Union of India, 1980, in order to maintain harmony and balance between part three, that is fundamental right, and part four, that is directive principles of the state policy, the Supreme Court ruled the section four and five five of the 42nd Amendment unconstitutional. In Daniel Latifi's case, um, we see that it is the best instance of judicial activism where five judges bench of the Supreme Court interpreted only the section three, clause one, subclause A of the Muslim Women's Right to Divorce Act that obliged the husband to pay maintenance and future provisions within the period of Iddat and thus save the deviation of the act from the article 14, 15 and 21. The recent Shingur case, 2016, is also a good example of judicial activism. When the Apex Court canceled the acquisition of land and ordered to revert back to farmers as it was not for public purpose. Further, we see that a concept of public interest litigation is a new horizon of judicial activism. Men Gandhi's case opened the Pandora's box and several judgments followed the principle of judicial activism. This ultimately gave birth to public interest litigation. Before 1980, the aggrieved parties who had the local standard legal standing could file a case, but Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer and P.N. Bhagwati made the history by recognizing the excess of the poor and exploited people to justice by relaxing the rules of local standard. Court held that any public having genuine intention and interest possesses the right to approach the court for the justice. Uh, further, uh, uh, going court through PIL, a letter or telegram written popular, properly is, was a sufficient. Hussein Ara Khatun versus State of Bihar, 1979, SP Gupta versus Union of India, 1981, Azad Riksha Pullers Union versus State of Punjab, 1981, 
PUDR versus Union of India 1982 and Bandhu Mukti Morcha versus Union of India 1984 are some of the initial PIL petitions on behalf of distressed people who were declined human rights. This new concept of public interest litigation paved a new way for the judicial activism by which the downtrodden people who were denied justice by both judiciary and legislature were given a new um, light, new hope, so that they just their justice can be granted. Some recent developments are also found in judicial activism process, like decisions on of the Supreme Court that the national elig el eligibility come entrance test meet would be the only test for medical and dental courses admission has created a lot of confusion. Supreme Court ruling in a PIL case ordered union government and the state governments to formulate new policy to combat drought. This case was Swaraj Abhiyan case in 2016. Supreme Court also issued notice to the Arunachal government to respond by he has recommended precedent rule in the state, but later recall realizing that governors are immune to court. Supreme Court is trying to reform Board of Cricket Control of India, BCCI, as per Lodha Committee recommendation. And it is amazing as BCCI is a private body, body since the constitution of BCCI is as per Tamil Nadu Society's Registration Act. Therefore, Supreme Court cannot alter the bylaws. On 3rd November 2015, Supreme Court invalidating the NGAC bill thwarted the authority of the parliament. On 3rd November, Supreme Court upheld that it would bring more transparency in the collegium system, but till date nothing had happened. The recent revolt of Justice J. Uh, Justice J. Chalameshwar on the issue of lack of transparency in the collegium system clearly proved it. Further, some critical analysis of judicial activism, counter majoritarian opinion or ruling against the judicial precedents cannot be called judicial activism unless it is active in constitutional terms. Some, some say that only by doing or uh, setting up some precedents, judicial precedents cannot fulfill the criteria of judicial activism unless and until it is mentioned in constitution. In many cases, judicial activism has caused undue interference in the political and social arena and over dependence on the international laws, personality driven adjudication, illogical use of institutional resources have resulted in legal uncertainty, delay, backlog, and over a loss of institutional credibility. Some say that over enthusiasm showing in the Jharkhand legislature assembly can could be avoided by remaining aloof as proceedings of the legislature should ideally be left free to deal as per the provisions of article 212. Uh, finally, while concluding um, uh, this topic, I, uh, I would only like to say that judiciary uh, is termed as the weakest organ of the state and judges do not have the power of the sword or the purse. Their strength rests on the public confidence, public faith. This faith establishes the constitutionality of the court and the, and the whole topic of judicial act activism lies on the public faith. It is not the judicial governance, but it is working within the limits of constitution to authenticate the reason reasonableness or unreasonableness of the functions of the other organs of the government with an aim to provide justice to the common people. In doing so, the judiciary must be fair, faceless, impartial, impassive, and humble interpreter of law like uh, um, in following the judicial activism process, the judiciary must act on the public faith. Also, public has a confidence in judiciary that must also be maintained by judiciary. But the problem arises when the judges become overactive and overenthusiastic to invade into the peripheries which are no value for them and this has become a fashion in recent times. But in today we see that in the veil of uh, judicial activism, judiciary is uh, overreaching their limits or overreaching their jurisdiction where they are not needed. So this type of judicial activism is also not needed in our country where one organ is overreaching their power and, uh, and creating an interference for the other organs. 
Exceptional powers should be retained for exceptional occasions and overuse devaluates its efficacy and results in incongruous effects. Similarly, if one uses over exceptional powers, that will always result in the decline of that organ. There must be fine line between the judicial activism and judicial overreach. If activism becomes overreach, institutional balance is bound to be destabilized. A true uh, sense of judicial activism lies on the concept that judiciary must act into their reach, into their jurisdiction, not to overreach their ju jurisdiction as it will destabilize the whole concept of uh, uh, stabilization. Courts are not for running the country. It's the job of the other wings of the government. And, and, uh, and keeping this in mind, courts must, court, courts must act into the, uh, into the straight jacket of their jurisdiction and not overreach or over actively participate in other organs function. Court must be sympathetic to the people into every decision of the government. The apex court should draw the attention of the other wings to solve the problems rather than it emerging as a single savior of the entire society. So lastly, while concluding my words, I would only like to suggest that courts must bring the attention of the other wings to solve the problem, not to uh, uh, solve the problem by itself and overreaching the jurisdiction of their own. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.